Hello, good morning everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Patron Driven Weeding, presented by Empire State Library Council. My name is Carolyn Bennett Glauda and I work at Southeastern New York Library Resources Council, the ESLN Council representing New York's Hudson Valley. Our presenters today are Kristen Hart and Rebecca Hyams, who are joining us from SUNY Maritime College. They will introduce themselves shortly so you can get to know which voice belongs to which person. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping notes. First and foremost, if you are having any technical difficulties with Adobe Connect, my colleague Zach is here to help you. He's on the line and he can give you assistance either by email, phone, or chat. You can find his name at the bottom of the participants list and uh, request a private chat and he'll be able to help you that way. This is a live interactive webinar and we encourage you to participate. The presenters and I are both using voice over IP to connect today, and we hope we're coming in loud and clear. And uh, we are the only ones with audio enabled, so if you have something to contribute, please use the chat box. If you're hearing us clearly, and if you're not hearing us clearly, and your speakers are set up and on properly, please let Zach know and he can walk you through some assistance. A way to participate in this webinar is by using the raise hand icon. At any point, you may use the participation buttons, such as agree for yes or disagree for no, and applause if the mood strikes you. Kristen and Rebecca will be able to see that, and hopefully it will get their attention and they'll be able to answer any questions that you have. We'll do our best to keep an eye out for them, um, so we hope that that will be a great way to participate. And uh, if you have any questions at any time, please ask them in the chat. This webinar is being recorded, so don't worry if you need to step away or if you need to miss something. We'll do our best to have the full recording up on the ESLN website later this week, and we will send you that link along with an evaluation. So now that we are all set, let's try out that applause button to give our presenters a warm welcome. And Kristen and Rebecca, I turn it over to you. Um, hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Kristen. I am the library director at SUNY Maritime. I am the one on the left, and I'm here with my colleague, Rebecca Himes. I'm the Cataloging and Digital Services Librarian, and that's my picture there on the right. Okay, so we are here today to talk about our experiment with patron-driven weeding. We initially presented this project in January at the Metro Conference, and at that time, it was conceived really as an information literacy activity, kind of born of desperation, meant to replace the prospect of boring lectures with some form of real engagement. Um, but we learned at the Metro Conference that people are really looking for innovative ways to tackle big weeding projects. In other words, we learned that they took the idea of patron-driven weeding seriously. So we have since scaled our experiment up by really trying to get our community to weed the collection. And we've kept track of our progress to share with you today. So we plan to talk about both phases of our experiment, but we're going to start with its genesis. Last fall, I was a new library director faced with a lot of problems, but two big obvious problems. First, I had a collection that billed itself as the nation's premier maritime collection, but that actually looked like a nightmare. So there was a huge disconnect, um, huge disconnect there between the narrative and the reality of what we had. We had no systematic acquisitions in place since it seemed like the late 1970s, and no mechanism in sight for, for putting in place coordinated collection development. We were sunk into a Depression-era mindset fueled by the illusion of poor funding and a very nonsensical division of labor. So it was a collection stuck in time, literally and figuratively closed off from the rest of the college. We're going to give you a taste of it here. Is it playing? It's buffering. Just come back right up here. A technical glitch. <laughs> so this is what it feels like in our stacks. It's not good. It's very closed up. Up ahead you see there's weird walls in place with like scary sort of doors that you're not supposed to go near or open. If you could if you could smell this area, you would smell mildew and mold. If you could hear there's like a crackling sound when you walk that's very mysterious. Um, so I don't know if you guys, if that resonates with you guys, if your collections are have a similar vibe, which is maybe why you're here, we'd love to hear about that. But yeah, it's a big problem, our collection. But actually, the more pressing problem 
was that there was a new round of information literacy sec uh, sections staring us all in the face. And I had a library faculty that was really hanging by a thread after a lot of upheaval, and we all differed really widely about what we should be teaching and how we were going to assess what we were teaching. So it was not a, really a great moment to try to introduce any kind of radical change in our approach, but I knew, I personally, if I had to stand in front of another class full of students who looked like that and lecture at them for an hour about how to search our catalog or use EBSCO, I was going to jump out the window, except that we work in a fort and the windows are really too small. Um, luckily, the new ACRL framework, um, which uses threshold concepts to explore the nature of information rather than these old competency standards that led us to sort of stand there and teach the interface, the new framework was here to help. Um, so for more information about the framework, we're going to post a link to it. If you guys don't know what we're talking about, you should explore that. Um, so there was a consensus, even in our faculty, where the consensus was rare, that this new framework idea was going to be the key to a new way of teaching. But how are we supposed to use these, these ideas? One professor that we talked to told us that students go into the library sessions expecting to be bored. And our one and only goal in a library session should be subverting that expectation that librarians are boring. Um, but wasn't going straight to abstract concepts like authority is construction, ex constructed, and scholarship is a conversation. Wasn't that really going to be just as boring like the experience of trying to get your teenager to talk about philosophy at dinner, which I've tried. It doesn't work. Um, and that's when, faced with these classes, we had our stroke of genius. Let's tell these kids to go upstairs and weed our terrible collection. So just to give a sort of a brief overview of you saw kind of the visual of what our collection looks like. But we have approximately, or we had at the start of this, about 50,000 volumes in our circulating collection. Of those 50,000, we've only had about a 15% circulation rate over the last 10 years. And it goes down to 10% if you only look at things circulating to our patrons. The other 5% are ILL. The average age of the book sitting on our shelves is about 44 years. They're from 1972, and many of them are from way before that. So our collection is mostly broken down. We have a large chunk of English literature and American literature. That takes up almost a tenth of it by itself. American history, physics, math, electrical engineering, transportation and communications. These are from the LC outline class numbers. This is how kind of I broke it down. Um, but the large chunk of our collection sort of falls into a couple of main subject areas. And if I look, if I then broke it down further and looked at their their number in the collection versus their amount of actual circulations, our largest two sections are severely underutilized and had very, very low circulation rates, well below the 10% or 15% overall. American history is the biggest area that actually has a decent, relatively decent circulation rate, and then followed by transportation and communications, which is one of the H's. And so it should be noted that our curriculum most of our students are studying um, things related to either the shipping industry or how to actually pilot boats and large vessels. They're sort of getting specialized education. We also have a large engineering program. So those are kind of the main subject areas that are taught in the curriculum. We don't really have, we don't have English majors or physics majors or history majors even here. So it's kind of, our collection wasn't necessarily matching the needs of the curriculum and even of the books that do circulate. Um, the physical condition of many of the books on our shelves it suggests either excessive wear or excessive age. Um, a lot of spines that are falling apart and things that are dusty. Um, the other things that do circulate, sometimes our students will take the smallest book, or sometimes they even think the oldest book is the best book on the subject. So they will take anything when they're desperate and they're working on their paper and it's due tomorrow morning. So they will check out they won't necessarily go for the best, they'll go for the fastest and the easiest thing to get. And they've been known to just borrow things that are not ideal. So just because it circulates doesn't mean that it's actually something we want to have on our shelves. Maybe we should have something better. So as Kristen alluded to, we gave them a task. Um, we sort of had a couple of different versions of this. I had adopted a scavenger hunt type of game that I adopted from some colleagues at Tompkins Portland Community College where I was having them run around and compete in the scavenger hunt. Um, Kristen had initially just done this as a standalone activity with some other activities. 
Um, so on the screen as the card that I actually gave them, a paper card, and this is the task that we gave them, the wording that we gave them. Go with your group to the second floor, which is where our stacks are, and find what you think is the strangest, oldest, funniest, or weirdest book that you see. Each member of your group, they were in groups of like four or five, may pick one book. And at the end of class, we'll select the weirdest one, the funniest one, and they'll win a prize, which is like candy. <laughs> um, so we did it kind of in a couple of different versions. So we knew as soon as we proposed this activity from looking at the kids' faces that, that we had achieved the, the main goal that, that our faculty friend had suggested we wanted to achieve in an information literacy session, which is that they were not bored. Um, they were very surprised that we were telling them to go upstairs and remove books from the collection. So we had definitely subverted the expectation that we were going to bore them. Because in fact, the idea was really inherently subversive, which on a very conservative campus like ours was, was really interesting. Um, so the students immediately became very animated, and they ran upstairs into those stacks, and, and they took a lot of time making their selections. So from a, an embarrassment of riches of really horrible stuff, which you saw, they really took their time. Rather than picking the very first thing they saw, which, which would have been easy, because as Rebecca, when she analyzed the collection, would tell you, at least 80 to 90 percent of our collection is literally garbage. Um, you know, ultimately, I think a library's job is to reflect the value of its community, and so it makes sense, though, that um, if you can only choose one title in an activity like this, you're going to gravitate towards something that's shocking and taboo, which is definitely what we saw when we took a look. Um, when we took a look at the selections that they had made, they fell into these categories. So we have a question. Did any, oh, so there's a question from Deborah. Did any of them question why we were throwing away library material? And yes, they, yes. some of them did. And we, mm -hmm. do you want to? Yeah, they, they definitely questioned it. And by asking that question, they, we actually found ourselves at the beginning of the exercise having those kinds of conversations that the, the new um, literacy, information literacy framework sort of is trying to lead us to have, which is, well, you know, information becomes obsolete. Um, sometimes, you know, the way we talk about, you know, some of this information isn't good, and we, you know, we were talking about the nature of what makes information valuable, what makes it lose its value. Uh, so, yeah, we definitely spurred immediately conversations. Um, so, yeah, the stuff that they chose fell into some categories. The first one, the, mo the biggest one, and the most interesting one, was that they definitely gravitated toward things that were taboo. So they, they managed to pull out these things, um, which as you can see, some of them are great. This book, Negro Heaven, is actually a very, it's a very uh, well-known example of this kind of thing. It was a, not a bad book, apparently, but was shocking from the very beginning. And it's, it's incredible that they managed to find it in that collection. And that they were able to mm -hmm. read the spine of the book they and were looking yeah. for. Um, you know, so they pulled out a lot of these that were really racist, basically, you know, just totally uh, outside the boundaries of, of what we want to, of what we want to be expressing, um, you know, sort of a lot of, um, yeah, imperialistic garbage. Uh, and then the next sort of fun category was the titillating category. They managed to find some pornography up there. Um, uh, you know, actually our campus... <laughs> We have a, uh, um, a uh, filter, filter on the internet which blocks porn, believe it or not. So um, that erotic art of the East. They, they actually oh got, got excited about the erotic art of the East. Um, so we had some giggles over that. So there were a number of things, and you see they had the, they pulled the Playboy interviews, which we talked about a lot because the Playboy interviews was actually Martin Luther King Jr., Jean Paul Sartre. You know, the Playboy actually used to fulfill a pretty important cultural, play a, you know pretty important cultural role. So I showed them that it wasn't, it actually wasn't dirty pictures or even dirty interviews. It was very serious interviews. So um, exposing myself, uh, Geraldo is actually, uh, calls himself an alum of our school. So uh, he didn't actually mm -hmm. graduate. No, he dropped out. <laughs> but uh, so there was, so there was some fun stuff uh, like that. The next category was oh, technology. technology. And this is like the least interesting one, really, because that's most of what the garbage we have up there with this kind of really crazy old technology books. Um, so they didn't pull as many of them as you might have expected, but there was some of that, and then some, there was just some funny stuff that made us laugh. Um, yeah, there was the queer things about Japan. We had to explain that words meant different things at different times, books about voodoo, um, 
French personality <laughs> problems. Yeah, that's a good one. I'm still giggling over that one, and it's been several months later. I Married a Boat was a good one. Yeah. So we had a lot of fun talking about these. Um, but the important thing is that, you know, during this judging phase, while we discussed the selection, the, the conversations that I'd really hoped to have were happening really naturally and organically. And in fact, the students were sort of pressing around us. They were eager to be part of this conversation about the books they had chosen. They lingered when they normally they book it out of there as quickly as they can. A lot of um, a lot of them asked to take their books home, and that was something we did on the spot. We just recorded the barcodes and let them take the books. A surprising number of them wanted to take it home as like a trophy. Um, so we ended up kind of being able to identify the kids that are sort of book lovers through that process, and then we talked to them more. We got some student workers out of this process. We got some kids, we had a lot of donations. I don't know if you guys have the problem of too many donations coming in and people expecting you, it creates a lot of work. Um, uh, so um, we, got, we got some of these kids to go take some of those. So we had kids walking out with armfuls of books. So you know, it, from that learning perspective, it really felt successful. So we had a couple questions come in in the last few minutes. Sharon is asking, did the faculty know about this weeding project? At that time, the faculty, we were doing these information literacy classes as part of one of those sort of introductory courses. So the professors usually came and they acted as judges and so they watched this activity and they, they really loved it because they too had started to dread the, um, the, these, these library sessions. So I, they, the, the faculty members knew about it and then later in the presentation we're gonna talk about, we, we scaled this up and included the entire faculty in this project. Um, and Fiona had a question, did we remove everything? And I'll get to that, almost everything. There were a couple that we put back. So I will get to that. I think we did deselect the Playboy interview. Yeah, the Playboy interview, because we can buy, the condition wasn't great of that book. So of the 120 books it, or so. I might have taken it home. You may have taken it's it. It's safe at my house, Fiona, don't worry. <laughs> we'll send it via ELD. <laughs> oh wait, maybe we can't. Um, so uh, the students pulled about 120 books, um, and very not surprisingly, about 85% of the books they pulled were on that 85% of books that had never haven't circulated in the last 10 years. Um, of the ones that had served, a lot were in poor condition. They were outdated. They had weird things up with them. We put about nine of them back. Most of them were either because they weren't actually. Some of it was the students kind of misinterpreted our instructions. I think one of them pulled like Jimmy Carter's papers or something. Like there were a couple that they pulled that they thought the title was funny, but it was like a brand new book that we had just purchased. It was something that was very specific related to the collect related to the curriculum or the needs of the students. So we put those books back. But there were some smart Alex. There were a couple of smart Alex that thought they were being cued mm -hmm. and weren't. So we put the we put a couple of books back, but most of them we did actually read. And we, we promised them. So they kind of used standard weeding criteria without us telling them, like, oh, when librarians weed, we tend to look for things like the date and who published it in the physical condition. And, you know, does this meet your user's needs and is it obsolete? Things from like the crew method and other sort of weeding literature. They did these things organically without very much instruction. These kids were freshmen, these kids had just graduated from high school and had various backgrounds in information literacy from wherever they had gone to school. So without us sitting them down and explaining to them what we look for in information, we were, they actually sort of mirrored it organically, which was really fascinating. I was kind of pleasantly surprised to see that. Okay, so what I really wanted was for the students who did this weeding exercise for us, they didn't all do it because we still did have a lack of consensus in our faculty over how to approach our information literacy. Um, so we did still have people doing traditional lectures and teaching the interface and then we had, you know, we were all doing different things. Um, and as, as part of this information literacy program, we do a pre-assessment and a post-assessment. We give them a test before and we give them a test afterwards. So what I was really hoping was that the students who did our weeding exercise, not, which was not all the students, would do better on the post-session uh, assessment than the students who did sort of more traditional lectures. They didn't. Um, they did about the same. So uh, I think the important thing here is that really that they didn't do worse. So letting go of the lecture really didn't do any harm and it did allow these good natural things to flow. Um, 
and as a matter of fact, as a whole, our students did worse on the post-test than they did on the pre-test. Um, but that's a whole nother matter. We think they just randomly answered the, t the questions on the post-test. So, so it was hard to assess. It was hard to assess the success um, in, in terms of that assessment measure. Um, the next thing I hoped was that we could, we could somehow empirically prove that the weeding students were more engaged in the library. So we sent out a survey to all the new students who had taken um, our library classes, and we wanted to prove that the students who had weeded were more engaged. But what we really just learned was that they're really, students are generally terrible at taking surveys. Um, they couldn't even seem to answer basic factual questions like who was your teacher and what activity did you do and like what section are you in? They were just all <laughs> over the place. Um, they were unable to really accurately identify what they had even done. So it seemed almost impossible to assess uh, the success of this activity. Um, I kept bugging Rebecca though. Uh, she's really good at running numbers. You go to the next one. I had her run it a million different ways, every possible way. We did manage to pull out a few positives. We were able to figure out who actually had done the weeding exercise, um, even if they couldn't self-identify that way. And those students who had done this exercise were more likely to take the survey, slightly more likely. So in my mind, that's said, well, okay, actions speak a little louder than words. They, um, they responded to our survey when we asked them to at a higher rate. So they are, you know, maybe that's a, an indication that they're more aligned with us at this point. Um, also, the people who we could identify as having done the weeded activity answered the question about how likely they were to use the library in a more positive way. The question was following your session, how often do you now use the library? So we were hoping to measure like the actual impact of the exercise. Those students reported using the library more. And I should point out that the reason why there's asterisks next to weeding and scavenger hunt is there was overlap between those. There were some students who did the weeding activity and the scavenger hunt, some who only did the weeding and something else, or some who only did the scavenger hunt and didn't weed. So there was some overlap in there. So it kind of been like that. So it, it was very difficult for us to assess in an empirical way the impact of this exercise, but we could definitely see from the students' faces, from the, from the feedback we got from the professors, um, who were too shy to tell us that they'd been dreading these library sessions and they were just so refreshed by this whole thing. So we, we, were, we could definitely see that uh, this activity worked to, to engage the students, to pique their interest, to subvert our, the expectation of what we had to offer. Afterwards, like we said, they lingered, they took books home, they talked to us, we made friends with some of them. Um, so as an engagement tool, we felt it was a success. So. So then the next question, um, which we asked ourselves, can this, weeding, can this weeding process really be crowdsourced? Because what we've done so far is pull a couple hundred books through this activity. And we think the answer is yes. So um, we moved into phase two of our project, which is to really reach out to the faculty and the entire community. Working with these students really helped us hone our weeding pitch on the campus to answer that question like someone asked. What happens when they tell us, like when they're questioning, why are we throwing things away? We're subverting their expectation. Remember that we have a collection that builds itself as the premier maritime library in the country, and there's a sense that we don't want to ruin it. And so it, we worked on our pitch this way by working with the students. And now we are we are have, we're prepared at the end of this to really get the faculty involved. Okay, so we started scaling up. We had a I shared all of our collection data, how many books we had, and you know, sort of what was on our shelves and things like that. At a campus-wide faculty event, we have this thing called assessment day. Everyone gets up and shares. For the teaching faculty, they share like their course outcomes and how well their students are learning. We're not a teaching department, so we shared information about our collection. And the faculty were shocked because they had never actually had that information shared with them before. No one had ever gotten up there and said, we have 50,000 books and they almost never get used, they're covered in dust and they're not meeting anyone's needs. So how can we, how can we make this better? So we, I actually got up there and told them, we want you to tell us what to keep and what to not keep and what to buy to rebuild our collection in a way that will be meaningful and useful. Um, at least one professor did get up at the back of the room and he raised his hand and he was like, oh, last time they did this, the librarians didn't tell us anything and they just went through and they got rid of all the important stuff and they kept all the junk. 
and we were like, okay, we definitely, this is why we're reaching out to you. This is why we want you to tell us. And he's actually come, and we did. Like, he's come now since, and we've spoken to him, and he's much more comfortable about the idea, and he's actually been pulling the things that he's like, this is junk, There's, this isn't taught here anymore, this was never that good in the first place, it's an old textbook, you can get rid of it. And we're like, great, we're going to do that. Um, Wait. So I just yes. I want I just wanted to add one thing here. After this, Rebecca did a great presentation at the at our faculty assessment day, and afterwards I got approached many times by people just saying, "This is so great that the library is sharing this information. The library has never shared this information. Just the idea that we were sharing information this way was was surprising to the faculty, and just that in itself was was really effective. Yeah, yeah so they tended to only hear from us when it was good data. And we're like, no, we need to share all of the data. It doesn't have to just be, hey, we did this great thing, but hey, this is something that we're struggling with and we want to do this better. Right. So, and, and the data we were presenting was that our collection was not effect effective. Not at so all. So Hope is asking a question related to that, and she wants to know, you know, can we identify any concerns in this process about weeding a more effective collection, a collection that has higher overall circulation? I mean, I you know I think this method can be used in a collection like that. You know, it yeah. would just be it wouldn't be uh, you wouldn't be taking out as much. Yeah. But you you know I um we're gonna talk a lot more and maybe we'll it'll raise those questions if uh or look for answers to that. I you know I still think you can crowdsource that the process if you bring in people with expertise um to, to analyze the collection even if it's not as and if ours was it's easy in, with ours or and some other uh, collections yeah. that are so ineffective. So we actually sent out a survey to the faculty asking what areas they'd like to look at. So instead of saying, oh, you teach this subject, we'll have you read this area, we asked them, we left it open, like, who are you, what department are you in, and what would you like to look at upstairs? Um, most of our responses came from faculty in our humanities department and our business department, um, less so from our science, engineering, and a couple of other departments. Um, what I was seeing was that I would run into people in the hallway, in the cafeteria, you know, wherever, at events, and they go, oh, I saw your survey, I didn't get a chance to fill it out, but I'm going to come. So for me at least, I'm the liaison to our humanities department, it was half and half people who filled out our survey and sort of more informal people who just were like, oh, I'll come, like, can I come on Friday, I want to go through this area. And I was like, okay, sure, you know, sort of work with them because it was sometimes a little bit of a challenge. We had some big logistical challenges in getting things going. Scheduling was probably the, one of the more difficult ones. Um, our teaching faculty have very packed schedules, so if they're on campus and they're here in person, they're pretty booked back to back in classroom time. So it's really hard to get them to come, and if they can come, maybe they can only come for an hour. And some of these areas are pretty large and require a lot a lot of time to go through. So we have people making multiple trips back, and sometimes it's hard, especially right now for us. We're getting towards the end of our semester ends the end of April, so we're already towards the end of the semester. It's really busy. So a lot of people are like, oh, can I come in May? Can I come over the summer? They want to come. They just can't. They just do not have the time right now to come, but they're interested. Um, the other big problem, now I'm a cataloger, um, so I went to try to divide things up by LC class because that's how our books are arranged up here. And one of the things I was finding was that one person was like, one of our professors was like, I want to read medieval and renaissance literature. And I was like, great, medieval and renaissance literature. And then I looked at the LC outline and it's divided by country and language. So I had to like identify where those areas were. You see on the picture there, that's actually from what I printed out and highlighted like, oh, this is where that area is. And I had a student worker like pull segments because there were maybe, you know, we had three books over here and ten books over here, and they were all over the place. Right. So it was challenging. Because <laughs> we you know this in this phase we were asking people to weed based on their self-identified expertise and LC call numbers doesn't really work that way. And librarians tend to just pick a section and we'll do that section, but with the, you know, this we had to really split it up and it Yeah, because they kind of pretty overlap fragmented. And do weird things. So a question came in, I just want oh, to address sure, sure. before we get too far. Uh, Deborah was asking, were you afraid the administration would think your budget material should go toward things that might be used, like databases and journals? I think that pointing out that our, that our monograph collection was ineffective is actually helping create a strong argument for the need to rebuild it. 
So I, I don't. I think it's actually the other way that um, we we need to rebuild. There's still a strong need for for a good solid circulating collection. We do have the we do have a, a maritime heritage collection that we have to keep. So there's a, a like a um, a different mandate that we have that plays into this as well. But I I actually think that being really open with that with the with this analysis of our collection and the need to fix it uh, is going to help us position us toward an actually stronger budget. Yeah, it's it's also the idea of like, you know, the collection we have right now isn't effective. It's not meeting the needs of our faculty or our students, but we need to meet their needs. We need to have the materials that will support them. So it's actually kind of strengthening our case as to why we need that. So it it, it definitely helped, helped us more than we've been afraid that it would hurt us. Um, some of our other challenges, I mean, the big ones were the scheduling and dividing things up. Also, getting them to let go of things has been a little bit of a challenge and collecting data. So I've tried my best to go up there. If I know they're coming and it's one of my people, I go up there and I try to collect data and take notes, but not everyone is able to do that or can do that. And some of the people who come and weed don't always tell us they're coming. So it, some of the data collection has been challenging. We've been able to get data on the books themselves because we can scan all their barcodes, run them against our ILS, pull the data on them. But we have some other challenges just in terms of more the um, qualitative data, you know, quantitative data. Um, so, so far we've had about 10 faculty members come, roughly six from the humanities department, two each from science and math, which is on our campus one department, and two from the business department. Uh, we've gone through just around a little over 5,000 items, which is about a tenth of our collection. And on average, we've weeded about 41% of the items that have been evaluated. Um, two of our faculty members, I believe they were both from our science slash math department, have kind of had scattershot methodology. They don't always tell us they're coming. They just kind of go upstairs. We've left carts for them because one of them would come down with piles um, of books and say, here, I want to weed these. But they're, going, they're not going, starting in one place and always going back to where they left off. They're going to different sections each time. So I have to wait till they say they're done to really analyze their data. Um, we had a question, are we being encouraged to replace with digital rather than print? Not really, we're not, I don't think. Nobody is really stepping in and telling us what to do. Um, I think we're going to, we're, we are going to try to buy more digital than we have been buying. Yeah. The, the reason we want to clear out that space and that stacks is make the collect collection more effective, but that you saw what that space looks like. There's, we want to, we want to overhaul that space and we have an opportunity to, the administration is ready to spend some money on that, but they're not stepping in on how we're going to develop the collection. They're letting us do it. Yeah, and I think some of it also depends on the subject area. I mean, again, our students tend to actually, even if you tell them, oh, it's available digitally, some of them will be great. This is awesome. And some of them are like, oh, man, I really just want a book. Like, they just want it in print. They're, some of them are not, some of, some of our students aren't tech savvy, and some of them are very traditional in their approach to everything. And not that that's a bad thing, but they want print. And that's what yeah. they prefer. And sometimes the professors prefer print. So I think it depends. Like some departments, more like the business, where we have a lot of online students, we've been looking more digital. But uh, for like the humanities classes, it's been more print. Um, have, did we ever keep something a faculty member wanted to discard? We'll get to that. There is there is one guy. Who, one guy. We got a we got a cart. We got a special cart of extra special stuff from him. So. Um, so our faculty generally read about 40%. That's what that yeah. shows. Our Roughly. goal, and I think we stated this when they started, our goal is to weed about 70% of that collection. Yeah. So the and they read 40. Yeah, and I'll get more into like the nitty gritty details of like by area in a little bit. Yeah. Um, okay. So <clears throat> we we used a we used a form we developed um, that we could share with you guys if, if you if you want to use something like this where we, we were trying to observe the behavior of, of, of our faculty volunteers and figure out what values they were using when they were making these decisions, what kind of methodology they naturally employed. Um, you know, generally, they, I wouldn't say they differed from the way librarians would approach it, you know, in, in any, you know, I think they looked at age, and I think they looked at circulation, and I think they looked at the, you know, the sort of authority of the book itself the same way that we did. But we did observe some very different sort of personality types assert themselves. The most interesting was we had a couple of stealth weeders who wanted to participate, but 
didn't, you know, they were kind of shy. I, I, I'm not sure what was happening, but they wanted to go upstairs alone. They sort of come and, and they, they want to take out like an armload of books at a time, making sure that, you know, we have the information we need, but they're being very careful. They're conferring with their colleagues. You know, they sort of come and go. Um, uh, we've gotten used to one guy in particular. We've gotten used to kind of seeing him coming in and out of the stack with armloads of books, and we just kind of let him do his work. It's hard to establish date on him, but but we trust him. He's the stealth weeder, um, and we do have some very apprehensive weeders who, um, uh, you know, the fearful weeder who they're initially really nervous about the process. One was the one that spoke out at at our faculty assessment day. Um, and they really want to talk through the process, and, and that's that's great actually. So we sit and talk about what you know why we're doing this, and then you know through that process he actually became a very aggressive weeder. Sort of at the end, after he understood what we were trying to do, suggesting we remove entire sections of the library that don't that don't support any kind of curricula that's taught anymore, including nuclear physics and fluid mechanics. These things just aren't taught at SUNY Maritime anymore. So he ended up deciding that, that those whole areas could go. We probably wouldn't have done that on our own. Um, we have some delicate weeders who really couldn't bring themselves to take out any more than five to ten percent of the collection. They were they were labeling everything a classic, and in the end, we decided to just honor that feeling because the the sense of ownership they got over their section was was worth the space that you know didn't get cleared. Uh, and then we had the weed leader. <laughs> Um, he came in promising to be brutal, and he came through. He was he's a um, um, business professor. And uh, he used some criteria that made even us really un un uneasy. So he, he set a hard date, nothing more than 10 years, everything ten, more than 10 years old <clears throat> is going. Okay. Uh, and then, but he also choose, used some strange criteria. For example, he removed all the books on Pakistan and Liberia um, on the grounds that they're too unstable and we don't do trade with them, so there's no reason to keep them. Um, in some cases, after he weeded a section, there's like one book left on the whole shelf. And we saw the card of stuff he 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 had left, and we really grappled with the temptation to put a lot of it back. Yeah. And then we were saying, are we really going to let are we really going to let him make this decision finally, or are we going to um, put some of this stuff back? It's actually still on the cart right now. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. I haven't actually run the data on it because they're sitting on carts. He actually did have a little bit of a there were some areas where he felt a historian or. There were, there were a couple of areas that were sort of in that large section that were really, even he felt were better suited to for someone else to look at. So even he had a little bit of qualms about some of the stuff that yeah. he pulled, mm -hmm. but he pulled it. So ultimately I will run mm -hmm. the numbers on that. But there were some books that he pulled that were like very recent or very related to like the history of mar the maritime industry or um, specifically I think in that area mm -hmm. were like the things about like the Longshoreman Union, like, you know, maritime yeah. um, labor movement and stuff like that, where someone may, especially in our new, we have a graduate program in maritime history, maritime studies, they may actually want to write a paper on that. So that was something that we felt might actually ultimately go back. So we were still crunching the numbers on yeah. him, but he was definitely so very brutal. <laughs> and we, you know, we have a mandate to keep everything maritime related, so that's a little bit, you know, that's a special case. Uh, and then there was our final category, which was the marital discord weeding. And that was actually surprisingly prevalent. We had two sets of spouses come through, and, and, they, and they had to argue their way through what was important before they could kind of find a, a happy medium. Um, so that was, that was kind of fun to observe, where you know, there was generally one that wanted to get rid of everything, and another that thought everything was classic. And there was a lot of conversations about that. We had one set of spouses who come in, came in separately, and both took a lot of things um, back to their personal libraries and asked us to please not tell their spouse um, <laughs> that they were hoarding books because they had promised not to do it anymore, but they were both still doing it. So um, that was kind of fun. We So we continued to use uh, one thing that, um, are you guys having sound problems? We had one person come in. Okay. The sound was going in and out. Multiple attendees are okay. Okay, no. All right. Okay, we're good. Okay. So, um, you know, the marital discord people uh, was kind of entertaining. That was kind of entertaining. They were like, please don't, please don't tell my spouse that I'm taking these books back to my office. And then their spouse came in and was like, please don't tell my spouse I'm taking these books back to my office. Yeah. It's like, I love these people. They're they're my uh, favorites. Oh, what I was gonna say was that since so many of the students wanted to take the books that they weed at home. Um, we use that as a carrot with the faculty as well, and you know, as, as long as they weren't reading books that really should stay just because selfishly they wanted them personally, which I don't think anyone was doing, maybe one, 
um, we let them take books home. We figure, we, I feel that it's better to have a, a home um, in someone's personal library, and we don't, instead of it going to Better World Books or something where we don't know what's going to happen to it, 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 it lives on. So, um, so you know, they had to, uh, we sort of recorded some of the stuff that they were that they were saying, uh, you know, as they were reading. Uh, are we just thinking about the students here? This is a very classic collection. It's focused on canonical authors, and then increasingly, this is making me uncomfortable. I can't believe you guys are asking me to do this. Um, one, one, the stealth reader came and told me he was keeping a, he was a, a math guy, he was keeping a few books on each, um, on Pascal and Cobal, and Cobal because some banks still use those, and, and you know, that was a criteria that he was using. Whoever made this selection early on did a good job, but then what happened? Um, my students are really interested in religion, um, but these, these good books are too hidden, now maybe they'll find them. Uh, let me see when this was last taken out, checks card. I think I'll take some of these home to read them. This, this was kind of interesting. This is what the cards look like in some of our books, where they, you know some of these old philosophy books that used to circulate like multiple times a year. But if you can look at that, it, like the last time this book went out was in 1965. So it's like a glimpse back in history of people's you know reading habits. It's pretty fascinating. I ended up keeping a lot of these. Um, you know, so so there was a lot of commentary that we tried to record as as they were working. Oh, we have such a nice m mix of works by Catholics, Calvinists, Protestant Jews, etc. She was the religion professor. I think I'm going to bring my students back to help me with this. Um, you know, so they they had a lot to say while they were working, and we tried to sort of get a sense of of what that meant. So I, as I mentioned, I. We had students give me the barcodes of all the books that the faculty had pulled from the stack, and I ran that against the list of items that are actually in the collection. Um, had we had more time and more energy and more people to help with everything, um, what I should have actually done is run the numbers against what is actually on the shelves. We haven't done an inventory in a little while, so there is probably some discrepancy between what it says is on the shelf and what's supposed to be there versus what is actually there. So these weeding percentages, I will say it up front, they may actually be higher than they appear just because, and it may also be that they looked at fewer books because I'm running that based on what the catalog says is supposed to be there from reports from the back end of our collection. So, yeah, we were. Um, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were debating whether we would whether we would recommend doing an inventory before you do a project like this, um, or whether it's worth doing it on the back end. On, on our on our side, it just felt like it would have been too much work to to do a shelf list and do an inventory first, and then do this all over again. So we're going to do an inventory um, when we're done. Uh, yeah, a question came in: How does patron driven weeding impact your collection development policy? It's the as I mentioned at the very beginning, we don't have a collection development policy really at this point, and so that's what we're working on now. And another good thing about this project is that trying to observe the faculty and, and, and our users and what they're looking for in a systematic way is going to help us shape the collection development policy that we're, we're doing right now. Um, so we're hoping it will have a direct impact because we'll, look at, you know, we'll be able to observe directly what people really care about. And we'll be able to shape our, our uh, the policy that we're we're hoping to put together over the summer based on that. So we had about eight faculty members that have gone through in order, so it was easy to kind of identify what they weeded. So those are that's some of the data that I'll show on the next slide. Um, the remaining two, it's going to take a little bit more time. And there are some faculty members that indicated that. When they get time, maybe over the summer, they want to come back and do it again. They want to go, even through the sections they've already gone through, they want to go through it a second time. Now that they feel more comfortable, or they understand, or whatever, whatever their individual reasoning was, they want to come back at some point and even go through what they've already seen. So we've started making progress. I divided things up. These are the people that have gone through sections where I can kind of identify where they've actually looked at things on the shelf. So two of these uh, columns on the, or two of these bars on the chart are actually myself and Kristen. Uh, Kristen started going through the philosophy section, that's the KH. She's gone through about 200 books, and I went through the music section, um, which is uh, about 470 books um, that I've evaluated. 
Um, and there's variation throughout. So our professor going through the Renaissance literature roughly looked at a little over a thousand books. Our American history person went through about a thousand also. And here's our favorite reader. And so a couple of these I'll go through a little more in detail. So it kind of ranged from a small section of around 200 to people going through a thousand so far with varying degrees. So comparing that, these are the actual weeding percents, more or less. So Kristen and I have actually been pretty brutal, but our sections are also sections that aren't really part of our curriculum here. So my section, there's a general music course that's taught and a world music course, and most of our books were like biographies of obscure composers that as a music student I would have read, but as a student taking music appreciation as an elective, they're not reading that. Um, same thing, more or less for the philosophy that's kind of integrated into a, a humanities sequence that the students take, but it's not, no one's taking philosophy classes here. Um, religion, um, <clears throat> world religion, Christian, the Christianity section, um, some section. of these things, film studies, we have a class in film studies. We have a class in the history of sport and sport in American culture. Um, those are smaller sections, they weeded each about 30% early literature too, but then we have things like business and management and American history that are larger parts of the curriculum. The American history was our delicate weeder. Very delicate. That's a and big collection and she w couldn't bring herself to take much off the shelf. Yes. So. But on the upside, her section is one that actually circulates pretty well. Yeah. So it was less of an imperative like, oh, this, this isn't even getting used and it's sitting here. Her section was one where it was actually more used than most of the other sections. I think it was the it's the most used section of our Even collection. Even though it's old, we'll still Even rebuild it. It might take more space in the in the end than than now. Um, so so it can help us sort of reshape the collection to be more in line with what's really getting used for sure. Yeah. So to sort of compare as a point of comparison, our weedinator, <laughs> as Kristen referred to him, um, he went through an area. It was basically H E in a BLC schedule, or HD, I'm sorry, HD, which is mostly books on management, trade, um, labor. He went through just under a thousand titles, and he, oh, so far, of the things we've actually processed, and he weeded about 72% of them. So he weeded, of that collection, the average age of the books were about, they were from like 1985, or from the mid 80s. So he weeded a very, very large percentage of books from that era. And he kept, most of the books that he kept were current, recent books. That's the only section where he didn't weed more than he kept. Everything else, especially the 70s and 80s, which is around when we established having a business program on our campus, uh, most of those books were weeded. Um, he did actually keep a couple, I'm surprised. But I think he kept, he, even as he said, he kept things that were considered classics yeah. or like sort of books that don't really, they don't really date themselves. It's more like... Philosophical mindset. So he's business. attached to certain Peter Drucker. I think they're yeah. all Peter Drucker books. Yeah, there were a couple of like prominent authors that he decided he wanted to keep, and so. But like we had some books from before 1920 on business and management, and he weeded all of them, um, which made a lot of sense. So, and this is a subject area that's major. We have an undergraduate and a graduate program in. It's a major curricular area, and this is a curricular area where. People need to have current information. If they're looking, I mean, some of the books he pulled were like business practices in Japan from the 80s. So if a student is doing research on like, I'm going to Japan, I'm going to do trade with a Japanese company, they're going to get all sorts of weird, outdated information about how to work with their colleagues, and it didn't make any sense. So we had stuff like that that like definitely needed to go. On the other hand, our professor did medieval and Renaissance literature, it's integrated into aspects of the curriculum, but it's something where if you have an older edition and it's the same exact text, it's just the cover is old, it's not going to hurt anyone. It's not quite the same thing as having these old outdated business books. So he went through a little over a thousand titles and he needed about 32%. He's someone who said he wants to come back and go through it again. Um, he was the one who said he felt uncomfortable. He felt uncomfortable. He said he felt dirty. Mm. I think that was the word he used. He said, I, felt, I feel dirty going through this. And he was actually our first one, once we set up the sheet, he was the first one to come in and actually, like, and we actually had the collected data on. Um, the average age of the books in his area were, they were from the 50s. And he kept a lot of the books from the 60s, like the largest number of books he kept were from the 60s. 
but that was also the largest number of books overall that had been there and the largest number that he also took out so he's finding his way through he kept all like the new stuff that we had and he gave me a list of things to add back into the collection later which was really nice okay um, so the benefits in this in this process were pretty obvious. Um, first of all, we're making some real progress in terms of a big weeding project that we really need to get done pretty quickly. Um, and while there's some cases where we really wish that the faculty had been more aggressive, they they found some hidden gems in our collection that we you know might have gotten rid of. They they were pleasantly surprised by the collection in some instances and felt a, a deeper connection to it um, and felt some a heightened sense of ownership, which I think is really, really important. Um, you know, because if they went through it and they're saying it's good, then they're going to be much more likely to, to think that it's good because they created it um, to some extent. If they're the ones who went through and made those decisions, it's really becomes really their baby. They're the ones that made that decision, so they're going to want to justify it. Um, it empowered them to first become honest about the collection, and then even more importantly, to give us input on rebuilding it and to like someone asked earlier help us shape a new collection development policy that's going to really support what they need for us to have to support the curriculum um, and it allowed us I think at, so far in this phase in the process to focus on as librarians weeding the areas where we are more truly expert uh, Rebecca's got a master's in in music I'm more comfortable in philosophy and literature so I can focus on these areas where I really do know what I'm doing I don't know anything about mechanical engineering even though that happens to be my liaison area so um, you know it, it it sort of frees us all up to to work in areas where we feel most comfortable um, you know one of the things on the forum was I asked them to rate their opinion of the collection before and after they did their weeding activity and, and their their feeling about the collection did dem demonstrably go up not that much but it did go up so their opinion is higher and that really matters yeah that, that's on a five point scale by the yeah. way so, so it went still, from like a two yeah. to like almost a three because we know, need three. to rebuild it yeah. so hopefully we'll, once we put in place the next step developing the collection to replace it whether it's print or digital um, the opinion will go, go even higher because we're going to follow through and make sure they know that we got the books that they asked for um, yeah so you know the next step is we are thinking about something like a phase three because the reality is this project is working like we're still actually working on it now some of this data we're sharing with you is very fresh data like from yesterday, yesterday. <laughs> Um, but the reality is if you walk door stacks it doesn't look that different we still have a huge job on our hands we still have a large swaths of that collection that need to be gone through um, so we're, we're wondering if um, you know this weeding project has has worked to improve the collection and it's definitely worked to in, in terms of our engagement with the whole community students and faculty but it really hasn't been truly crowdsourced so are we really gonna let go of whatever remaining fears we have about the selections that people are going to make and have really crowdsourced the, the, the process. So we're like, we're considering having events where we're going to invite people in, have some food, and like let them go to work on the collection. We haven't totally decided on that, but these are the next steps that we're looking at. We're, we're starting to involve students again as weeders, but in a more um, giving them whole sections to work on and looking at how they do with it because when we had some of our students do it, they really love this. Um, they feel they feel really good about being asked to, you know, being trusted a little bit and, and being asked to look at this in a substantive way. It's a great learning experience for them. Um, so we're, you know, we are, we are looking uh, at ways to involve them and really, really, truly crowdsource this project. Um, yeah. References, I guess. <laughs> you know, we've and reached our, our last slide. And one, the one final lesson that I think. <laughs> Is, is really was a good outcome of this thing was that it's really important to analyze your collection and share that information with your community really openly because people are interested in that um, and then and then they're going to want to come forward and and help and feel engaged in it in new ways um, so that piece of it has been really important so we have a question from Deborah will your faculty play a large role in our rebuilding absolutely they've already started to um, a couple of them have come to me in areas I've weeded, I've gone with them to weed, yeah. and they've given me, like, actually handed me lists, like, please buy these books. Or they kept mentioning, oh, do you have this book? I don't see this book here. Can you buy this? And they're already starting to do that. I think for a long time, it was kind of, 
iffy. Sometimes they they know who to ask when they would ask, but the fact that we're getting them to actually come into our space more than they've had in the past, and some of that is literally like opening doors and then walking through instead of walking outside. Um, they're coming into our space more, they're seeing things, they're seeing us more, and they're, they feel like they have a face that they can talk to you to actually give us input. And, and yeah. the more that we actually say, oh yeah, we bought that thing you asked us to buy, the more likely they will be to continue to ask. I mean, right now we're getting to the end of the budget year. We're like, please tell us what to buy because we have to spend our money. Tell us what to spend our money on. And they're, they're happy to do it. <laughs> yeah, they are happy to do it. And, and yeah, like we really want to use this data that we're getting to build a, a really good collection and development policy. I mean, ironically, we're not really doing much PDA on this campus. So this rebuilding is happening through really face-to-face uh, conversations, but hopefully we'll be able to put those mechanisms in place so that it will be self-sustaining and another person won't have to do this 20 years from now in a different way. So does anyone else have any questions for us? I know we've kind of asked, answered them as they've been coming in, but you know, f please feel free to ask, ask anything. Uh, Sarah said, do you offer weeded materials to other institutions? such as the reanimation library. I don't know what the reanimation library is. Um, for the most part, we send our stuff to Better World Books. Um, we tell the faculty they can take what they'd like of the stuff that we're actually weeding. And sometimes we put stuff out on a, on a book truck for students to take, and it just says free books, and they yeah. take them. And then sometimes it, we send them off to Better World Books. Okay, she sent so, us a yeah, so, You guys can look at the, we want to look, we're all going to check out the reanimation library as soon as we get off this. It sounds yes. pretty interesting. Interesting. The um, yeah, and one of the things that I think I'm sort of seeing is that it's not like I think we we were afraid to like oh man they're not gonna either they're gonna keep too much stuff or they're not gonna do whatever. But I mean even forty percent weeding forty percent is pretty good and except for the one person, everyone else is basically weeding things we would have weeded anyway. So I think to open it up more and let more people in to this process there's not really going to be that much of a loss. Like the students we're having go through areas are students that we trust. Most of them are, are student workers um, that we're asking to go through things. And they're students that we trust. They're not going to be smart asses about it and take things that should stay in the collection. They're sort of taking it very seriously and going through. And um, it would be interesting to see sort of with more students and additional faculty and staff how that plays out. So, so I mean, yeah, to continue answering your question, Sarah, I, for us to make lists and offer the stuff out on, on lists, unfortunately, I think it would, we have a big project we need to finish, and I think it would slow everything down. We need to kind of box it up, look it over, make the list, collect the data, and then we need for it to go, unfortunately. So if, I wish there was an easier way to do that. Yeah. That would be great, but... Yeah. We've been sending it to Better World Books. Yeah, most of the books that we've been pulling are like also super, super. Like I have to take a Claritin and my inhaler before I go up. Yeah, it's yeah, they're pretty bad. Super dusty. Yeah. They just haven't been touched in decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're bad. So it's... we're even getting some back that Better World Books doesn't want. They're <laughs> yeah. starting to come back like zombie books. <laughs> so. And then we have to take them out back. Yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> Dump them in. Yeah, you know, we're not gonna pollute the bay. We're gonna. Be good. I see. Someone is typing a question. So we're so. nearing the end of of the, of our hour. It's, um, okay. But we'll keep answering questions, and, and uh, it's this thing is being recorded. So feel free if you need to step away, we'll come back and check it later. Okay. Do we check to see if we have any rare material? We haven't really been doing that. Uh, well, I did some of it a in little the engineering bit. department right. with the weeding, with the reference books. Yeah. But with mm -hmm. the circulating collection. We haven't really been checking the circulating collection. We've just kind of been sending the stuff mm -hmm. off. Again, it's a lot of stuff, and I could, I could run the things through GD, um, GDM and sort of see how rare they are within at least SUNY and our consortia. Mm -hmm. But to actually start doing title by title and checking their value is just way beyond labor intensive and be, unless it's something that's actually specifically maritime related where it's something in our area we really feel we need to keep we've just been letting it go and yeah we do the have faculty. a couple where the as you as fiona says i guess the faculty would have a sense of that anyway they do and if it's something i think did um our economics professor take that 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 she was talking yeah, about the keens yeah yeah we had a set of keens collected works that does not relate to our curriculum in any way and it was it was a rare set or it was an old set and it was special to her 
And so she, we actually let her take it because we were like, first of all, we can't actually resell it ourselves. So it's not really going to benefit us in any way. And it made her really happy to be able to take that. Yeah, at least it has a, a good home. It has a good home and it's, you know, we rehomed it properly. But yeah, yeah we, for us to do anything beyond that is really not... For us to run the numbers, check them, and then find a place to house them when they don't really fit our collection in any way, and in a lot of cases, never fit our collection to begin with. Um, it just didn't make any sense. So we're just kind of okay with letting those things go and not worrying about it or losing sleep over it. Yeah, we did. There were a couple of uh, rare literature books where the pages had not been uh, cut, cut um, and and we set those aside. Actually, there's a couple things that, that have come to our attention that are sort of seem special. So, we and anything maritime related, we're keeping for right now. Yeah. Uh, and then that we have to assess whether any of that stuff is truly rare. So, does anybody else have any questions? We're at the end of our time, but we're willing to answer them. Also, Stick our emails. For a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, our emails are up on the screen. If you ever want to send us an email and ask us anything, we're happy to share our slides and our data and everything else. I just <laughs> ESLN librarians live for data. <laughs> okay, please fill out the survey uh, by taking a few minutes to fill out the webinar evaluation. And Carolyn's posted in the chat box a survey, so please fill that out. Tell e uh, ESLN, the artist formerly known as the Three R's, what types of programming you'd like to see in the future. Um, and help them develop their programming. So thank you, Fiona. Yeah. So Kristen and Rebecca, thank you so much. This is a great webinar, and thank you. Uh, we had wonderful participation from the uh, from the attendees today. So uh, great yeah, okay. questions by everybody. Very great. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming and thank listening. <laughs> All right. And thank you, too, for chiming in. All right, I'm going to go ahead and mute now and end the recording.